So in the last screencast of the class, we are going to talk about nutrition. Now, the science of nutrition is an applied field that focuses on the study of food and water and other nutrients and ways that living organisms use them. Nutrition scientists use the principles of nutrition to obtain answers to questions that have a great deal of practical significance. So for example, um, they may help people uh, find the proper components of a, a good diet for them um, and the best way to maintain proper body weight um, and, and just to be healthy overall. Or they could focus on the nutrients needed by people with specific illnesses or injuries. So nutrition is really a critical science. Now, the fuels of the human body are carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins, and those are derived from food. The reactions that release the energy from these substances are among the body's most important biochemical processes. So in this chapter, what we are gonna focus on is what those nutrients are. And so when we first start, right, there are two kind of divisions here. One is macronutrients and one is micronutrients. Macronutrients are just substances that are needed by the body in relatively large amounts, okay? And these include carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins, and we get all these from food. Now the second kind of division are micronutrients, and these are substances that are needed by the body in only small amounts. Um, so like, for example, milligram or microgram amounts. Um, those small quantities needed suggest that some of the micronutrients are utilized in enzymes. Right. And they're generally either classified as a vitamin or mineral. Now, in addition to macronutrients and micronutrients, the human body also needs to receive the appropriate amounts of water and fiber. So we're gonna call those other essential nutrients. So when we talk about water, the water is approximately 45 percent to 75 percent um, of the human body mass. Right? And then, so water is critically important. Fiber right, um, is indigestible plant material that's composed primarily of cellulose. And um, it makes no contribution to the body in for the form of macronutrients or micronutrients, but it does prevent or relieve constipation by absorbing water and softening the stool for easier elimination. So we have um, nutritional guidelines. So a number of countries of the world have established nutritional guidelines for their citizens 
in an attempt to improve and maintain good health nationally. In the United States, the Nutrition and Labeling Act of 1990 brought really sweeping changes to the regulations that define what is required on a food label. Now, the official guidelines are um, called RDIs um, for proteins and the 19 vitamins and minerals. And then you have daily reference values for other nutrients of public health um, importance. So let's give some definitions to this. So we have daily values, and these are just reference values developed by the Food and Drug Administration which is the FDA, right? Specifically for use on food labels. Okay. And then we have reference daily intakes or RDIs, and these are just standards for proteins. vitamins and minerals that are used on food labels. And then we have daily reference values and these are standards for nutrients and food components such as fat and fiber. That have important relationships with health. Okay. Now, for simplicity, all reference values on food labels are referred to as those daily values. And in 2016, the Food and Drug Administration finalized these new nutrition facts labels for packaged food. Um, the new labels make it easier for consumers to make better informed choices, ideally. And then the FDA decided to use 2,000 calories as a standard for energy intake in the calculated DRVs. So, so we use a standard of 2,000 calories, right, for energy intake. Okay. Now that can be quite misleading um, because uh, different people um, weigh different amounts and so they may need different um, amounts of calories or they have different activity levels. Um, but again, this is just kind of a, a general blanket statement for what we would consider like the average person. Now, just as a reminder, one nutritional calorie equals one kilo of calorie of energy. Okay, so that's just a different way to kind of measure it. Now, these guidelines are reviewed and revised about every five years. Um, and recently, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which is the USDA, has issued the Food Guide My Plate, which is designed to replace the old My Pyramid posters with new recommendations. So, if if you remember, there's food pyramids um, that, at least when I was in school, what they looked like were kind of like this, this, and this. And at the very top, when I was in school, way back in the day, it was fats. And then at the very bottom were breads and grains. 
And so I went home in the 80s thinking that I needed to eat more bread. That is what I went home with. Um, now, these have been updated for things like fruits and vegetables to be at the bottom. And so the, this pyramid has gone through lots and lots and lots of reiterations. And so a lot of being in, being, uh, in nutritional science is being able to communicate what people need to do in a way they can understand. And so I think there was just so much emotional um, kind of and fatigue with the pyramid that the move to my plate is really helpful. And it shows kind of the how much of these different things that you should have. And you can see about half of the plate should be fruits and vegetables and then uh, protein, dairy, and grains. And so, uh, of course, I think that's one of the reasons they moved away from the pyramid. Now, what we're going to do is look at those macronutrients, right? And so we're going to start with carbohydrates. The carbohydrates are kind of the main source of energy. So when we talk just about carbohydrates overall, these are the main dietary source of energy. Okay. And these provide useful materials for the synthesis of cell and tissue components. Um, these facts plus the relatively low cost and pretty readily avail uh, availability of carbohydrates have led to their worldwide use as the main dietary source of energy. Now, despite their importance as that dominant source of energy, many people consider foods that are rich in carbohydrates to be inferior, at least in part because of their, uh, their reputation for being fattening. Um, it's now recognized that this reputation is generally not deserved. Um, most of the excess calories associated with eating carbohydrates are actually due to the high calorie foods eaten with the carbohydrates. So for example, potatoes and bread are often eaten with butter and um, a high energy lipid. Now, dietary carbohydrates are often com classified as simple or complex. Simple carbohydrates are the sugars that we classified earlier as monosaccharides and disaccharides. So simple carbohydrates are just um, the sugars that are classified as monosaccharides and disaccharides like glucose or sucrose, right? Now, there are complex carbohydrates and these consist essentially of the polysaccharides amylose and amylopectin. And remember, these are collectively called starch, okay? Now, complex carbohydrates um, can also include uh, cellulose, right? Um, which is another division there, right? Um, but it can't be digested by fiber, by uh, humans. And so that's really, when we talk about fiber, we're talking about cellulose, okay? Um, lots of nutritional studies include recommendations about dietary carbohydrates in their report. And one conclusion common to the most of these studies is that the typical American diet does not include enough car complex carbohydrates. Instead, there's a lot of simple carbohydrates. So I believe when we talk about um, carbohydrates kind of getting a bad rap, it's because we focus a lot of times on simple carbohydrates. So when somebody is trying to get healthier, a lot of times they cut carbohydrates um, and they're really trying to cut their simple carbohydrates or uh, added sugars. Now, the second...
infusion that we're going to talk about are lipids. Um, about 95% of lipids in the body and in foods are triglycerides. Okay, um, these are concentrated sources of energy. And we consider that because they basically provide more than twice the energy of an equal mass of carbohydrate. Now, these contain some uh, fat-soluble vitamins and help carry them through the body. Right. And these include essential fatty acids, which cannot be synthesized in the body and must come from the diet. Um, and so one of the things that you can see here are different food sources or things that are used in food and the amounts of saturated fat, um, other fats here, and then monounsaturated fats here. Okay. Now, fats improve the texture. Of foods and absorb and help retain flavor. And they also um, have a satiating effect, so they prolong satiety um, because they're digested more slowly. And so this is just that feeling of being full Now, the next um, macronutrient we're going to look at are proteins. Now, proteins are the only macronutrient with an established RDI or reference daily intake. And I've got some there for you on the right. Um, and these are um, used in the body to aid in the production of new tissue as the body grows. And so you can see here where pregnant women and nursing mothers need more than the average adult, and it's because they're, they're growing lots of new tissue. Um, it's used for the maintenance and repair of cells. It's used for the production of enzymes.
hormones and other important nitrogen containing compounds right of the body and um, the energy supply here is the same as um, carbohydrates which is four calories per gram fats are nine calories per gram um, these are broken down into individual amino acids that are absorbed into the body's amino acid pool. Um, they can be classified as complete proteins if they contain all the essential amino acids. Okay. And these are things like um, uh, meats. Meats will contain all the essential amino acids. Now let's talk a little bit more about these essential amino acids. So we learned in chapter 19 that proteins are natural polymers of amino acids, and they're joined by these peptide linkages. Now on digestion, the proteins are broken down into their individual, individual amino acids that are absorbed into the body's amino acid pool, right, and used... Um, to make proteins for the body that the body can use. Now, the essential amino acids that are listed here on this table must be obtained from the diet. Because they cannot be synthesized in the body, in the amounts we need. Okay. Now, um, proteins that do not contain all of the essential amino acids are classified as incomplete. And these are things like beans, um, rice, basically things from plants. And so one of the things that um, if people are vegetarians, they have to be really careful about is to make sure that they are eating a meal with all of the essential amino acids. Because if you eat meat, meat has all of these amino acids in it, so chicken will have them all. But beans and rice are incomplete proteins. But if you eat them together, a lot of times they can give you all of the amino acids that you need. So um, as, as you think nutritionally, um, sometimes that is a um, consideration that people who are vegetarian or vegan need to take into account. Okay. Now... We're going to talk about some micronutrients, and one of the micronutrients that we're going to talk about are vitamins. Um, these are organic compounds that cannot be produced by the body in the amounts needed for good health. Um, now, the highly polar nature of some of the vitamins is going to render them as water soluble. So we're going to have two kind of divisions of vitamins. We have some that are water soluble and then some that are fat soluble. Okay, so those are our two divisions. Um, these water soluble ones are highly polar in nature. Um, they function 
as coenzymes, right, except vitamin C. Right, and any excess is excreted in the kidneys. So these water-soluble vitamins are not stored. If you have any excess, it's just excreted in the kidneys. Now, um, these, uh, when we talk about water-soluble vitamins, there are nine water-soluble vitamins that have been identified and they're designated by names, uh, some by letters and other by letters and numbers, like for example, vitamin B12. Okay, and we're gonna look at that in the next slide. Um, now, there's also some common names as well. We also have fat-soluble vitamins. These have nonpolar molecular structures, so they are nonpolar, right? And they tend to function like hormones. And they are not excreted in water, so you can have excess accumulation And that can lead to toxic effects. Okay, so let's look at some different vitamins and their sources. Um, when we look at uh, these vitamins, you can see there's B1 and B2. This is thiamine and riboflavin. So there's two ways to refer to these. And you can see their functions here. And then what I always find really interesting are the deficiency conditions. So like if you don't have enough B1, you can experience beriberi, which is nausea, severe exhaustion, and some paralysis. Uh, not enough um, riboflavin, you can end up with dermatitis, which is skin problems. Um, niacin, uh, if you don't have enough niacin, you can get pellagra, which is weak muscles, no appetite, um, diarrhea, and dermatitis are some of the symptoms there. Vitamin B6, um, will result in dermatitis or nervous disorders. Uh, vitamin B12 can result in um, anemia, right? And it's particularly rare except in vegetarians because this comes from meat, fish, eggs, and milk. Um, so that is particularly rare but will pop up every so often if somebody is really avoiding these um, dietary, di these in their diet. Other uh, vitamins are folic acid. This is really important for women who are pregnant um, because uh, growing tissue needs um, folic acid. Uh, it can result in anemia. Um, pantothenic acid can also result in anemia. If you have a deficiency in biotin, uh, there's dermatitis and muscle weakness. Um, Vitamin C is also known as ascorbic acid. Uh, this is found in citrus fruits and tomatoes, and it can result in scurvy, um, which is tender tissues, weak bleeding gums, and swollen joints. And this was something that sailors used to really have a problem with. And um, the English uh, Navy did a experiment where they sent sailors out with um, lemons and limes and I think oranges and the limes were the best at preventing scurvy. And so they were really the first ones that made a connection between vitamin C and scurvy. Or they're, they, I don't know if they were the first ones, but they're the ones that get a lot of credit for it. Now, I want to point out here that these are our fat-soluble vitamins. They're A, D, E, and K, or A, D, E, C, is the way that I remember it. Um, and here are the things that they, of course, can um, result in. Uh, I want to point out blood clotting disorders here. Um, if uh, people have, if you have patients or if, if you work in nutrition and you have patients who have had any sort of heart procedures, a lot of times those patients are told to avoid vitamin K um, because they can result in some blood clotting type issues there. Now, let's talk about minerals. So minerals are metals or non-metals in the body. In the form 
of ions or compounds. Okay, um, you can have major minerals. And these are the ones that are found in quantities greater than five grams, okay? So these would be things like calcium and phosphate. Uh, these are primarily inorganic structural components of bone and teeth, right? And so there's, they're kind of our big ones here. Um, calcium is right around 1150 milligrams. Phosphorus is right around 600 milligrams. Um, it can be also be things like sodium, potassium, chlorine, and magnesium. Um, and these are ions in bodily fluids. And they're particularly, sodium and potassium are particularly important for the heart functioning appropriately. And so you can see that these are also considered, right, those major minerals, sulfur as well, okay? Then we can have trace minerals. Right? And these are found in quantities less than five grams. And so examples of this are things like iron, manganese, copper, and iodine. Right? And you can see here, those are considered trace minerals. And these tend to be components of vitamins. enzymes, hormones, or specialized proteins. All right, and so that's what we find there in our trace minerals. Now, let's look at some of the trace minerals and um, dietary sources. Um, as well as deficiency conditions. So when we look at this, we see we've got calcium, it's in dairy foods and dark green vegetables, and that can result in uh, stunted growth or rickets or weak and brittle bones. Chlorine is found in table salt, also seafood and meat. Um, it's used in uh, HCL and gastric juices, as well as acid base reactions or balance in your body. So if people don't have enough of that, they'll have muscle cramps, um, they can also have a reduced appetite. Magnesium is found in um, a, just kind of a variety of places, um, but if you don't have enough magnesium, it can inhibit growth, weakness, you can have muscle weakness and spasms. Phosphorus, weakness, calcium loss, weak bones, potassium, muscle weakness, paralysis, sodium, muscle cramps, um, reduced appetite, um, and that's in most foods except fruit. Sulfur um, is in protein, and it's just a component of protein, so deficiencies tend to be very, very rare. Now, here are trace mineral sources and functions. Um, these are just kind of, I find, really interesting. Um, do, not, do not memorize these, right? But we do find these, um, these quite interesting. And I, I like to talk about them because every so often, um, if people are uh, deficient, um, these will pop up. For example, if you're deficient in iron, then people can have anemia. This is um, can be one of the more common uh, deficiencies that we see. Um, people used to be really deficient in iodine, but then they started iodizing salt. Um, and that helped with that as far as that deficiency. So this is where we are um, going to end the screencast. We are not going to do all of chapter 22, um, but I did want to cover the macronutrients and micronutrients and talk about those in case you see those in a later course. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to pop by my office.